Thank you all for coming to our second discussion section. And uh, this is, this, as you know, this is, we have a series of discussions uh, and this, the theme of our second session, this theme is neuroscience, emotions, and virtual social connections. We have um, our colleagues, Dr. Seth Aberton and Dr. Will Kalkoff are gonna be discussing their essays and then we will have time uh, for asking questions. Um, I'm just going to go over the basic outline of uh, today's discussion. Um, I'm, uh, after I finish explaining uh, the organization, uh, Russ is going to be introducing our colleagues. And then um, Seth and Will will each take about 10 minutes to go over their essays and their, um, anything else they'd like to add. And then um, usually uh, Russ and I ask um, a question, a brief question to get them started and they each take around five minutes to answer our questions. And then we open the discussion up to the audience. I will be moderating the discussion. Uh, so please uh, type your questions in the chat option. You could type it to ev everyone or type it to me. Um, and I will be calling your names. And so you can unmute yourselves and ask the question. Or if you prefer, I could also um, ask the question. Um, so thank you again all for coming here. Um, just an, overview. We have very exciting essays, very exciting discussions um, today. I personally do research on neuroscience and emotions and social connectedness. So I'm very excited to have them both here. Uh, Seth Everton's essay argued for the pr promise of potential dialogue between sociology of emotions and effective neuroscience. Uh, so this is uh, what he will be talking about. And Will Kalkoff, Richard Serpy, and Josh Pollock's um, essay focused on, the, on their reflections on biosocial research and the device-mediated communication, this, which is what we're doing right now, Zoom or everything else that's happening virtually. So again, I want to thank you all for uh, participating in today's uh, discussion. And uh, Russ, you can go ahead and introduce our discussions now. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rengen. And uh, it is truly a delight to uh, have two more uh, really awesome sociologists uh, leading the discussion today. And I, I'd like to begin by thanking both of them for contributing such thoughtful, insightful um, essays for this series. Um, Seth Averton is an associate professor of sociology at the University of British Columbia, who has broad interest in social interaction and, uh, and um, integration, uh, focusing on particularly emotions in relation to suicide and mental health, um, social psychology, cultural sociology, organizations and institutions. Um, his, he's been extending uh, Durkheim's classic framework uh, to better understand uh, the, the challenge of suicide amongst adolescents. And I'll just read uh, parts of, of three um, uh, of his article titles to give you a sense of, of the uh, scope of his work. Theorizing the affective roots of the social self. How social networks facilitate suicide diffusion and adolescence under pressure, a new Durkheimian framework for understanding adolescent suicide. Will Kalkoff, um, we are delighted to have with us, is himself a former uh, chair of the evolution biology and society section of the American Sociological Association. He's a professor of sociology at Kent State uh, where his research focuses on how brains represent uh, and support social processes in humans with uh, his work largely done in his electrophysiological neuroscience laboratory. Um, He's, his um, articles include uh, work such as teamwork and decision-making under threat, neurodynamics of social status, and status characteristics and opinion formation, a theoretical integration. Um, this is really great work. These are really great sociologists 
these are the right people at the right time uh, to talk about social interaction in our rather um, socially constricted current social world. Um, thank you. Um, uh, Will, um, I'd ask you to begin uh, with your uh, 10 minutes if you'd like to uh, introduce briefly your uh, two co-authors. Um, you're welcome to. Yeah, they're, am I unmuted? Yeah, I'm unmuted. They're both here today, Richard Serpy and Josh Pollack. Um, I'm very happy they were able to join us. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the paper, and then I invite them to join in the discussion part. I think I'm going to share my screen, if that's OK. Are you able to see my screen? Yes. I OK. Am. All right, well, I'm just going to jump right in, since we only have uh, a few minutes, and talk about our think piece on, is video chat a sufficient proxy for face-to-face -face interaction? And really, the, the pandemic context is what, well, we've been thinking about this stuff for a while, but the pandemic context is really what inspired this think piece and the neurosociological argument for a related line of research that we're going to get started on as soon as we're able to resume uh, human subjects data collection. And this is really a story of the good, the bad, and the ugly. I mean, the good was, you know, when we all found ourselves suddenly sequestered at home last spring, I think we, we were all pretty grateful for the fact that we had things like Zoom and Teams and FaceTime. I mean, what would we have done 20 years ago, even 10 years ago, without this technology being available? So it allowed us to work from home, maintain some level of connection with our friends and family, well, there's a bad side of it as well. And it wasn't too long before you heard people starting to talk about how exhausted they were by uh, Zoom meetings. And the, the term Zoom fatigue was introduced. And you, people started talking about touch starvation. And at first, the virtual happy hours were great. But then people really started missing the real thing. And there was an ugly side to it as well. I mean, not only were people getting terribly sick from the virus, and dying, but there were, you know, indirect casualties from this as well. I mean, people were being, were felt trapped at home, isolated, depressed, turning to alcohol and drugs. And so we sadly, we had to start talking about these depths of despair. And so some of the questions that I want to talk a little bit about today is why isn't video chat a sufficient proxy for face-to-face -face interaction? And what, if anything, can we do about it? A little bit about the problem. You know, so the brain modules uh, supporting human interaction are the product of millions of years of evolutionary forces acting on Homo sapiens and our ancestors in face-to-face -face context. And we really aren't used, you know, in this of evolution. We really aren't used to what now consumes, and I'd go so far as to say, enslaves us. I mean, my guess is for most, many, if not most people that are here right now, your phone is within arm's reach. Um, you know, a phone that we use in, in part to communicate with other people through Zoom and FaceTime. Um, and it's naive to think, uh, as we've argued in the think piece, that this literally this overnight shift to interacting increasingly through screens isn't going to have any consequences for social organization, civility, or the or the consequences are only going to be good. You know, maybe it, maybe I'm just getting older, but it concerns me that there's now some survey data showing that younger generations actually prefer interacting through screens, and I, I wonder if older generations aren't far behind. So we're taking a neurosociological approach to these issues. And there's really four parts to the argument. Um, first off, humans have a highly evolved ability to step outside themselves and imagine how others might react to different courses of action that we might choose to do in a situation before we even do them. So this is what we call role taking. And Sociology, uh, this is, it's axiomatic in sociology. This is pretty much fundamental in group life. And just imagine how crazy and chaotic life would be if we couldn't 
engage in role taking. The second point is that role taking overlaps in our view with theory of mind in neuroscience where theory of mind is our ability to infer and reason about other states of mind. And so we think of role taking as one of the specific functions of theory of mind. Theory of mind role taking in mirror neurons. Um, in our view, th theory of mind and role taking are likely supported in the brain by the mirror neuron system. Mirror neurons, as many of you probably know, are present in several brain regions and they become active both when a person engages in a specific, specific behavior as well as when they see someone else engage in the same behavior. And then finally, what are the consequences of technological intervention here? Insofar as theory of mind and role taking are acquired capacities tied to healthy development of the human mirror neuron system, which develops very early in life, in the first year of life, we had better hope that people's increasing use of electronic devices for learning and interaction, especially at younger and younger ages, doesn't interfere with this developmental process or given the now demonstrated plasticity of the human mirror neuron system, it's unraveling in people. There's cause for concern. Uh, recently, I've really been getting interested in Kelly Dickerson's research. She's a cognitive psychologist. She's at, I, I think, Flexion Inc. in New York. She's done some fascinating groundbreaking work on how mirror neurons support communication in the digital world. And the upshot of her work is basically this. The, she argues that the neural architecture underlying the human mirror neuron system operates less efficiently and effectively in the presence of temporal, spatial, and social disruptions inherent to virtual communication and screen media platforms. So we refer to this as the denuancing of interaction in video communication. So you've got the temporal issues, the verbal response delays, which, you know, even if we're, we're talking about uh, milliseconds, humans start to get irritated around 600 milliseconds uh, when uh, that kind of verbal response delay, and that's easily achievable in these kinds of uh, communication platforms. And then there's the spatial disruptions, the fact that we're in different environments, different contexts. I'm at my house, you are wherever you are, we don't have a shared environment. We don't have a shared context. And that's going to disrupt the development of, of joint attention, which is, is critical for smooth shared interaction. There's also social issues, the lack of mutual eye gaze. And this is something we're actually working on technologically right now. It's like, in order for me to appear as though I'm looking into your eyes, I have to look into my camera and you have to look into your camera. So we're both looking into cameras. We're not looking at each other. And so that disruption of mutual eye gaze is a problem in, these, in this medium as well. The suppression of nonverbal cues, which we know are very important to social interaction, you know, especially if we're, I'm zoomed in on myself or you're zoomed in on your face, I'm zoomed in on my face. We're going to miss a lot of information that's part and parcel of social interaction. There's attention distraction. I mean, you know, in some of these Zoom meetings, we've all been in these. You know, it's like the Brady Bunch family exploded. You don't know who to look at. So you just spend your time, your eyes are darting around the screen. You're looking at different people. You might not even be paying attention to the person who's speaking. And there's also the problem of heightened self-attention, which has cropped up in our research. Um, so we found that when we have audiovisual types of communication systems where the participant sees a, a mirror image of themselves, they just spend all their time staring at themselves. And so they're not really paying attention to the interaction partner. And that's another reason why uh, this is a suboptimal means of communicating compared to face-to-face. -face. So what can we do about it? Um, well, we can fight fire with fire. That's what we've always done. Fix technology with more and better technology. And that's uh, something that we're starting to work on now, as I mentioned. Getting particularly interested in 3D virtual reality. And so we have our new virtual reality wing of our electrophysiology lab. And so, you know, we're, we're looking at 3D virtual reality, especially implementations that incorporate haptic touch feedback and allow us uh, by virtue of the technology itself to incorporate more nuanced meanings that we rely on in interaction. Um, as Dickerson and her colleagues have argued, tactile VR 
uniquely allows for um, what's called sensory motor binding of voluntary actions and causally linked sensory consequences, which is supported by mirror neurons and is critical for effective social communication. So it's these challenges to sensory motor binding and mirror neuron functioning in video chat environments like the one we're in right now that might help explain, at least in part, why many of us feel at sort of a deep gut level that this method of communicating is just not a substitute for the real deal for face-to-face -face interaction. So that's really the thrust of what we're working on right now in the Electrophysiological and Neuroscience Lab of Kent and also in partnership with our new Brain Health Research Institute. So we're really excited to start digging into some of these, these areas when we're able to do that when human subjects research resumes. And so I'll end it there and stop sharing my screen. Thanks. Thank you. Seth, you can go ahead and start with your essay. Thank you, Bill. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody on the West Coast, or the East Coast in the middle, Midwest, and good morning on the West Coast where I am. Will, that was such an interesting, I love the paper. Uh, I just picture myself because I'm about to lecture a little bit later today to a bunch of boxes of Zoom boxes. And I picture myself now wearing a full on suit in a little room, walking yes. a virtual uh, classroom. That's the goal. I, I'm not sure whether that's going to satisfy me, <laughs> or, but it would definitely make me feel like some strange sci-fi movie. Well, um, we aim to find out if it will satisfy you. <laughs> I, I, I can't wait to find out. <laughs> uh, so um, my essay is a little bit different. It's uh, a little bit more theoretical. Uh, I came to affective neuroscience sort of late uh, compared to probably several of the scholars that are either presenting or visiting, listening. Um, I was more of a cultural evolutionary sociologist looking at sort of large scale macro group level change. Um, but I've always been interested in social psychology and emotions and recently started reading more and more about affective neuroscience. So I'm not quite as much of an expert yet on this area, but I've been uh, very interested in trying to solve a, a larger problem. And that problem is that since the 70s, as those of you who know the sociology of emotions, um, we, we've come a long way, at least in the discipline, in trying to think more about emotions, trying to talk about them, trying to study them empirically, trying to theorize about them. Of course, uh, Cooley and Durkheim wrote really important classic texts when we didn't know very much at all about emotions, uh, but you know, as sort of classic to most social sciences and hard sciences for most of the 20th century, emotions were sort of considered uh, feminine. They were sort of pushed aside as not rational or important in sort of in explaining action or organization. Um, and so we don't, we, we still don't, to a certain extent in sociology, think of emotions as causal forces. And that's sort of one of the underlying problems. And um, on top of that, besides probably most of the people here today, uh, and a few that are not here, like John Turner or David Franks, um, sociologists have not really considered us as apes and as emotionally evolved apes. It is sort of this, this thing with a supercharged set of emotion centers and, and you know really complex emotional palettes. We usually start just with modern humans, and by modern, I mean probably the 1940s on. So we don't really have a historical grasp or evolutionary grasp. Neuroscience, of course, has begun to consider this more seriously over the last three decades. And um, to me, the fruitful dialogue here is that neuroscience tends not to think uh, like sociologists and think about the way structure and culture work. And therefore, there is something fruitful that uh, can connect the two together. And uh, again, unlike Will and his team, I don't, I don't have a research program here. I'm primarily a suicidologist right now. And so these are larger questions that I think would be great to answer and to move forward. So what is it about sociology of emotions? What do we do? Um, there's three sorts of ways that sociologists talk about emotions. They're not uh, completely analytically distinct. The first is we often think of them as signals. This is probably the closest to uh, neuroscience. That is, um, so identity control theory uh, sees the, the individual as carrying like a standard of their role identity, like student or man or husband. And as they are 
communicating that identity to others, they're also getting appraisals from others. And if those appraisals don't match what they believe is their sort of identity standard, there's a, uh, a negative affect. And they are uh, motivated to um, try and create congruence between the environmental input and their internal uh, signals. And there's a whole set of control theories like this in sociology and symbolic interactionism and micro sociology. Second form um, is this sort of emotions as performed. This is probably the closest to the constructivism uh, that, that is probably, I guess, a fourth form of emotions work. This comes out of the Arlie Hochschild school, but also Irving Goffman. And this is the idea that uh, emotions, it's not that emotions don't have a biological root, but what's interesting and important about them is that people work to express or suppress them based on environmental cues based on situational cues and based on uh, the, the rules, the, the ideological rules about what they believe is expected of them. And so in this situation, we see people as um, agents, right? That is emotions are ways of conveying or properly uh, meeting expectations and obligations. So a person goes to a funeral and they dress a certain way and they prepare themselves in their car for sadness and grief and they walk into the, the funeral and they don't feel any of those things, they're driven to align their feelings one way or another. Maybe that is by faking crying or by you know, changing the muscle in their face or thinking cognitively about what it means to be sad and trying to align themselves with the situation or in other cases to actually suppress their emotions. The last um, Way the last approach is, is very related to the performative approach, and that's the emotions are structured. And this is sort of a sociological idea that uh, things like status and power uh, distribute how and who's allowed to feel and express what emotions, when, where, why. And so there, this, the performance and structured side are sort of two sides of the same coin, right? But it's just a question of um, which approach one takes. Of course, sociology has created some, somewhat of a set of limitations, the most common of which, and again, this is not all sociologists and, and, and probably not all motion scholars, is that there's still this sort of belief, this uh, leftover hangover that emotions and cognition are separate from each other. That is, we can study emotions as a thing apart from cognition that is rational. Uh, action is not connected. And of course, as we all know, this is just simply not the case. And then there's also a wing of sociology that continues to see emotions as, as completely constructive. That is, there's nothing universal about emotions. There are a set of primary emotions that people feel. Um, and so these, this, that, these are more general limitations of the discipline. Now, there's any number of affective neuroscience that one could probably draw from. Uh, the, for the essay that I wrote, I drew from Jack Pansep, Pansep's work. Um, Again, a lot of it is very hypothetical for humans, but uh, it's very tantalizing. It's very interesting. It's a different approach to thinking about emotions. It, it avoids the, the discussion of primary emotions and focuses instead on the evolution of these seven primary affective systems that were all related to survival and in mammalians. And he argues all the way back to reptilians, but I, I would rather just keep it in the mammal. Um, and there are, some of them are very recognizable to, to sociologists. Some of them are very interesting and offer sort of new possible research paths. One is he calls seeking, and this is the, the motivation to pursue resources. And, you know, he connects this to one of the most, the earliest impulses of a neonate that's born and immediately begins to seek uh, satiation, to seek food, to seek resources from its mother, even before it can actually see and this, of course, is connected to human curiosity. This relates to intrinsic motivation to actually seek out things besides our primary caretakers. But at ultimately, the survival mechanism starts there. Um, the two that probably everybody's familiar with is he calls rage and fear, right? Anger and fear. This is the rage is related to protecting one's resources when threatened or lost. And fear is the motivation to avoid pain and destruction. Um, and then uh, lust, which is the motivation to bond intimately with another or many others. Um, this is about sexual reproduction, but Pangsep's not interested so much in sexual reproduction as he is interested in the, the construction of bonds through you know, close intimate relations that are usually be 
not necessarily between parents and children because he has a special uh, system for that. Um, care and play are his two sort of happy, related to uh, happy uh, emotions. Care is the nurturance, the motivation to nurture children. Uh, play is the motivation to bond with uh, conspecifics through interaction, through rough play. This is where uh, individuals learn how to integrate, how to follow rules, what the rules are, how much play is good play. And as well as we know through research on play and ethnography, uh, it's about learning how to become an adult too, or a mature um, adult. And then the last one is panic and grief. This is another interesting one. This is about avoiding rejection, isolation, and exclusion. And so this is also very ancient in his opinion. So when a neonate feels the desire to connect with the primary caretaker to get resources from it, the minute it loses sight, it, it feels panic, right? It, it, it doesn't know where it's caretaker is. And when I explain this in my uh, undergraduate classes or grad classes, I always think of like a four-year-old kid who gets lost in a department store. And we all have felt that feeling before. We all probably have gotten lost and it's probably indelibly uh, stained on our brain. So to me here that this, these seven systems are interesting for sociology, uh, right? There, there's this avoidance of reductionism uh, that sociologists often fear in the sense that Pankstep and, and his students have demonstrated these systems are actually designed to learn. So any social object can become something that we consider to be cherished and therefore we seek out whenever we need it. And of course we can feel panic and grief when we lose it. So it could be our computer, it could be our significant other, I mean, it could be a whole host of different things. And of course, four of these systems are dedicated to sociality. So lust, care, play, uh, and panic are all social uh, systems, which are which suggest there are different ways that people can bond and different sort of archetypes or different sorts of uh, profiles for relationships. The other two things I would say neuroscience can offer um, is that these affective systems and emotions in general can do three different things in, in terms of behavior and cognition, command, control, and coordination. Uh, sociologists often think of control, as I gave the examples of uh, identity control theory or affect control theory, but they don't often see emotions and cognition as being coordinated, that is actually working together to do things. They either emotions are a signal to drive action or they are something to be actually controlled themselves. And the other one is command. This is one that's very surprising to me that sociologists haven't thought much about this one, but obviously the, the example of the four-year-old being lost in the store, right? We're talking about panic, taking over their, their thinking and their doing. And this is not just something that four-year-olds do. There are people who live in states of anxiety, temporary anxiety, chronic anxiety. Uh, and so sociologists really don't ever think about what that means when there's an emotion that actually drives people's pathological behavior, at least most sociologists that study emotions, not all. Um, the other thing that, that I think neuroscience lends here is that uh, we could think about, when we think about the uh, individuals or relationships or groups or even categories of people, classes of people, or even societies, we, we sometimes talk in the abstract about like emotional biographies, that is people have a, a not just a, a, a story about themselves, but they have like an emotional biography, something that defines their life. And so I think of like Thomas Sheff's work and, and thinking about how like communities or individuals can have shame biographies. And so this points to the, the possibility that people, individuals or groups can be, can have sort of rage uh, profiles or fear profiles or panic profiles, or they could be defined by play, obviously, and care. And so neuroscience, this Pancept's work sort of points to some, again, some variation and some sort of interesting points to potentially do some research on. And the flip side, sociology has a lot to say for this, and, and this is what I'll conclude with. For one thing, um, neuroscientists rarely ask the question, which objects matter to people, fully grown adults, why do they matter? And sociology is all about how people get connected to a group or a social identity, how that comes to matter, how different identities can be more important than other identities, why that happens. And uh, also we, we're interested in things like place and how people can develop a place identity, how they can become attached to a space. So when we think about you know, um, 
cultural trauma related to refugees, right? Being dislocated forcibly from a homeland, right? We can talk about objects as being actual spaces and things. Uh, and then, you know, this connects to the other key social science aspect, and that's we are interested in the distribution of populations in time and space, right? And, and the distribution or, or how people are distributed in terms of race and class and socioeconomic status and on a whole host of other uh, factors should have an, uh, relate to an uneven distribution of these affective systems. And that is some groups should have more likely activation or salience with rage, whereas some are more likely to be activated by lust, right? And so the question then becomes, how do these different distributions, right, and the cultural profiles that they take on interact with these affective systems and vice versa? So that is, there's a whole lot of other pieces there, but uh, I think I'll leave it there because um, leave some time for Q and A. So thank you. Thank you, Fred. Um, now Russ and I are uh, briefly gonna just discuss, ask a question or two. And then uh, you, Seth and Will, you could answer these uh, questions briefly, and then I will open the floor to discussion from the audience. Um, Russ, did you want to go ahead? Thank you, and thanks for these uh, fantastic talks. Um, I'd like to pose to both of you, actually, um, a, a question um, a, about how much the medium matters. And of course, this uh, addresses specifically Will's talk, but um, it, it also, I, I think, is an issue that um, I, I'd like to hear more from Seth about. And uh, the, two things come to mind uh, about the medium uh, that are maybe different, but related to what you both said. Uh, number one, in, in relation to research that I've uh, been doing that had to be adapted to remote uh, delivery of social therapies. Um, it's, I, I've been focused on um, what's happening in mental health service delivery um, during this remote environment. And, you know, it's of course shifted uh, totally to online delivery um, in many places. And the, the research that emerges suggests um, that rates of participation are higher, uh, dropout is lower, um, and there are many people who like it. It's too early to answer the question of, of whether there's a difference in the impact. But my question is, you know, are there some trade-offs here that could be maybe um, associated with some uh, benefits um, that maybe compensate for what is lost. In other words, the ease of connection and uh, gr greater frequency of it. Uh, related, a, a, a different aspect about that comes to mind in thinking about what's going on in our rather fraught political environment. You know, I'll bet those proud boys are proud, not just because they're boys, but because they're, they've got each other's backs and they're together and they are instantiating in their own twisted way, which of course happens in, in all kinds of ways across the world, th the evolved need for group cohesion, group identity. And you know what? The, the, the right wing was at the forefront of using email, you know, computer mediated forms of connection to build their social networks 20, 30 years ago. And, and so my question about that again is, you know, hey, isn't there something working here that in fact, does have an evolved evolutionary origin. And, you know, like you, I, I want face-to-face -face interaction. I think most people do, but when it comes right down to it, you know, aren't there some, uh, isn't there evidence um, that, you know, it, it's happening uh, ev even without uh, 3D in ways that are in fact very emotionally meaningful. Thank you, Russ. 
Um, I'm also going to go ahead and uh, briefly ask my question, and we're hoping that um, you could each take turns and answer both Russ's and my questions first. Um, so my question is that, um, so I'm, a, I, I'm an inequalities researcher. I'm a social psychologist and I identify as a neurosociologist, but I am primarily interested in inequalities and disparities around the topics that I study. So uh, when you were both discussing affect and digital technologies, I was uh, thinking about um, disparities with respect to both emotions and affect and also use of digital uh, communication technologies. So um, one of the, um, if both um, emotions and affect, so they rely on um, evolved capacities and also social interaction and use of these digital technologies. I was wondering your thoughts and your speculations perhaps on how um, disparities or inequalities on both emotions, because Seth, you mentioned uh, trauma and how that might be leading to disparate emotions in different communities and also digital technology use because the, a lot of these technologies are not accessible all around the world to different communities and how that might be um, creating maybe new inequalities or new disparities also in terms of human evolution, our brain functions and mechanisms. Because I'm thinking if younger generations are uh, very immersed in these technologies, but if only younger generations of a certain of certain societies or certain segments of societies are able to be immersed and used and others aren't, what does it mean? Um, what does this mean in terms of the future of human societies? Uh, so that, I was just interested in your speculations on these. Thank you. Who goes first? <laughs> Sounds like you do, Will. Oh, I should have kept my mouth shut. Um, I also invite my co-authors to jump in at any point too, uh, Richard and Josh. So if you have anything you want to add, please do. So uh, the first question, the, the good and the bad, I definitely think, uh, I, I think I've, I'm sort of becoming known as an outspoken critic of the, these kinds of technologies that we're, we're coming to rely on overnight. But I would have to acknowledge there's a good side to it too. But being sort of the, uh, the cynic that I am, um, I wonder if some of those things that make it good, that draw us in, oh, it's really easy. You know, now I don't have to drive into work for a meeting and waste all that drive time or, um, so there, there's a, definitely a convenience to it. There's absolutely no question that it, that it makes our lives easier. We already lead pretty fast paced lives. You know, why waste time commuting if I can do all this stuff from home? So I definitely understand the draw of that. Um, and I, I do agree with you that maybe it is too soon to tell, you know, uh, what, uh, what the grand impact of all of this is going to be. But there, are, there certainly are some indications that something is wrong. So, you know, as we've talked about, you know, if you look at surveys, people say, I would be a, I would be a wreck without my devices right now, but I hate that. And I really want to get back to face-to-face -face interactions. So it's kind of prima facie evidence that this just isn't quite there. And so the solution is, you know, to develop, as we said, you know, fight fire with fire, develop more and better technology. But that kind of brings me to Rengen's concern is who's going to have access to that? So let's say we do this research and we develop these fancy ways of, of transporting people into these virtual environments so that instead of sitting here looking at the Brady Bunch screen, uh, with our virtual technology, we scan our bodies and uh, we suddenly are in a conference room at a you know, beachside conference room in Florida where we're actually in the room. And who's gonna be able to afford that, that kind of technology? So, you know, the people that could potentially benefit from the rapid technological development that is unquestionably coming are the wealthy. So, and the, the people, they'll be the people that are able to take advantage of that. So, this is definitely a concern that I have. In fact, we were talking, I was talking to someone about that just yesterday. So, we develop all this fancy stuff, and only the rich can afford it, and only the rich can benefit from it socially. So, I don't want to talk on and on and on and give Seth a chance to jump in or my co-authors. 
Yeah, um, I, I can make a couple of observations on this. So I, I currently am, and, and this is just based on my observations, I am in two different communities studying two different school districts where they've had some massive like adolescent suicide problems in one of the schools. Um, and, one of, and so I sit in on weekly district safety meetings where they basically like the socio-emotional behavioral heads and the security heads and like the suicide uh, folks. And, I, and there's just this huge group of people. And then weekly, I go to one of the high schools virtually and sit in on these uh, SIT teams, which are these, again, safety, they're, they're safety intervention teams, which essentially identify when school's normal, they identify kids who are at academic risk early or who are having trouble at home or who are uh, appear to have potential suicidal or mental health issues. So they try to identify them early and create safety plans for them. So these things don't spiral out of control. And um, so I, I agree with, well, there's some good here. For instance, in these communities where suicide has been a problem, suicide is currently not a problem. And uh, sitting in these safety meetings, disciplinary issues have been down tremendously, uh, several hundred percent down. Um, the number like child abuse has gone up, right? That's like the things that they talk about most during these meetings, which is would be expected in a time like this. Um, but the downside is that these meetings are consumed essentially with either the lower income kids not be, having the appropriate technology, not having Wi-Fi at home, not knowing how to use the various applications on the computers to do the assignments or to connect. And then the, the sort of shame side of this where many of them don't want to turn their cameras on because of what their household looks like and fear of being stigmatized because they live in a crowded house or a messy house or, you know, it's obvious that they live in an apartment instead of a house or something of that nature. Um, and, and so there's this sort of like layer of, of stress among the, the lower income kids. The higher income kids are also stressed out because the course low, coursework has been reduced half to you know 70%, which is great. It takes some of the pressure off, but they have no idea what college is going to look like. They have no idea what the application process is gonna look like. They don't know if they're competitive anymore. They're bored at home because they finish their assignments fast. Um, and so there's this weird component to being at home and, and working, but then there's this other piece, right? That essentially societies have been evolving in, in the Western world to differentiating economic and family functions. And we've got to the point where most people go to a job. They don't work at a workshop at home. They don't have it attached to the house. The whole family's not involved in the business. I mean, those, those things are still there, of course. And what's now been asked of people is to essentially turn their household into a multifunctional space. And not everybody has the space to do that. I know I live in Vancouver and my apartment that I share with my two children and my wife is 1400 square feet, which is huge in Vancouver. But imagine a family of four with a 900 square foot house. And where do you do your office work? Where do you, how do you separate yourself from your kids? And so we've been giving surveys out and this is like the biggest thing that's, that we're finding is parents are saying that they at least, I think it was, um, well, 25% of our parents, over a thousand parents answered these surveys. 25% um, were saying they had a mental health issue every single day since the pandemic started. And another 40% said that they had three or more mental health, like bad mental health days. And it's mostly because of the conflict with their kids, organizing time, job issues. And of course, this disproportionately has affected women as you know, most of the research has shown working mothers. So. It's, it's tough, it's hard to imagine, right? And that's why I made that joke to Will. I could imagine walking around in my haptic suit, like where would my kids be when I'm walking around in my haptic suit? I'd need to have like a special like uh, telephone booth to be in my haptic suit in, so. Thank you, Seth, thank you both. Um, I'm gonna turn to the audience questions now. Um, the way that I'd like to do is that I'm gonna pick some questions so that I can give an equal chance to both papers. Um, the questions that we, we won't get to all the questions, but uh, we will still compile them. So if you wanna pose a question, please type it in the ch chat. We compile these questions and send them to the authors uh, after the session and they get a chance to still answer them and we send it back to you. 
Um, so I'd like to start with uh, Rosemary Hopecroft. So if you could um, unmute yourself and if you want to pose your question, Rosemary, you could go ahead. Okay. Um, after uh, see what I asked. Um, basically, uh, what is the evidence on how the neuroatypical are responding? I was wondering about that. You know, people who have social issues like Asperger's and autistic. Do you do you know anything about that? Uh, I. I haven't read uh, or I haven't seen a lot of research on that, but I, what I do know is that Microsoft is working on it. Um, one of the researchers, Zoyomi, I believe at Microsoft has done some work on managing the needs of autistic individuals with autism and video calling. So, I mean, that's some of the, the latest stuff that I think is coming out. So, I mean, it's a recognized issue. So I don't know that effort very well, but I would, if that would be a good place to start with um, Zoyomi's work on managing stress and uh, they're at uh, Microsoft. So, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a recognized issue. People are definitely thinking about this. And I also appreciated the point that, you know, this, some of the limitations of video chat are giving us all a bit of a taste of some of the challenges faced by individuals with autism. And so I, I could only hope that that would help inspire empathy and technological developments that benefit not just the neurotypical, but also the neuroatypical. So, but yeah, I, I do know for a fact that companies are working on that, specifically Microsoft. That's very interesting. Um, there's a, <clears throat> there's a book by, uh, uh, a person named Alex Durek, uh, who was active in sociology and then left uh, in the late 90s. But the, um, um, the book is entitled Autism and the Crisis of Meaning. And Alex actually has a chapter in there that sort of uh, uh, anticipates these issues of, of uh, um, changing away from physical touch and physical presence and how that's going to have an impact on, um, on, on people who are on the spectrum. And, um, you know, the controversial part of Alex's thesis was that he thought all of us were on the spectrum, <laughs> that there are people who are high functioning Asperger's and that's those of us sitting on the screen. And then there are those people that are, uh, you know, stereotypical autistic. Um, and he, he, um, uh, um, uh, but but he talks about this mediated uh, how mediated interaction might have an impact. The other thing that uh, has that I've been thinking about for a while that I want to raise here is Marshall McLuhan's work. Um, some of you are probably have never heard of him, uh, but um, uh, he 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 wrote stuff about uh, media. Uh, in the in the uh, 50s, a Canadian uh, communications scholar, um, and and his book, the 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 book that came out was uh, uh, the media's the massage. That was actually a typo in the book title. It was supposed to be the media's the message, but he said let's leave it because it's right on because it has this play in these two things. There's the message, and then there's mess age and then massage, and then mass age. And, um, uh, and in that, he actually suggests that the development of this media is gonna make things better. He talks about a global community, all that sort of thing. But near the end, he has a coda, which talks about the possible um, negative outcomes of the expansion of media and mediated uh, interaction. Uh, and the other thing is, is that uh, during that time, the same time this was coming out, there were all these futurologists. Uh, um, there's a book called Future Shock, and all of a sudden the name of the author just flew out of my head. But he's got a section in that where he talks about the unknown impact of the it's rapid Alvin, development Alvin of technology. Sorry, what? Alvin Toffler. Right, right. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Rosemary. 
<clears throat> but I think um, I, I think we should not forget, as we're thinking about these things today, the fact that many of our uh, colleagues that are no longer with us or you know have stopped writing um, have touched on some of these things, and and uh, uh, so I'm always interested in situating these things. So I I, I would encourage people to, if if these questions are um, are important to you, I would encourage you to take a look at them. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Um, we don't have a lot of time left. left. We usually end at um, 10 a.m., but I'll still try to get as many questions as I can. I'd like to uh, take a question for Seth next. I see that um, Ed Gibney had a question. If Ed, if you would like to go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Yeah, sorry, I wasn't expecting that. I just asked it, and I didn't think I would jump the queue so far. Um, let me just read it off. Um, Seth, what do you make of uh, appraisal theory, if you know about that, for emotions as a possible way to break down what you've described as sociologists seeing, um, you know, a wall between emotion and cognition? Uh, that's a good question. Um, so, you know, and, and it's weird because I'm speaking to the choir here, right? I mean, most of the, the folks on the panel, as well as in the audience that know the sociology of emotions and know affective neuroscience would argue, uh, would, what I'm saying is common sense in, in certain ways. Um, and I think most sociologists buy the idea that there's sort of a bi-directionality, right? That there's, that we can learn to identify certain sensations and label them in certain ways, and that that can then increase the likelihood of those sensations being felt. Um, but one of the things that sociologists just have, I feel, have struggled to do, and, and again, this isn't all sociologists, but sort of mainstream sociology, is that they they ignore, for instance, you know, um, studies by like Michael Tomasello uh, and like research on experimental research on chimps and like infants and like thinking about sort of the where the bidirectionality starts, right? Like the sort of ingrained survival mechanisms that we have, the affective impulses, and how that is taught to us, of course, right? We, we usually start with a fully grown human. You know, most emotion scholarship either studies college kids because they're convenient samples, or they study adults, right? Either with pathologies or, or normal humans. And and the, the focus is just so much on either the performance of them, right? Very little research on the actual command, for instance, right? Or like traumatized kids who have been sexually abused or physically abused and like sort of the pathologies that that develops and how those emotions can take control of people. And so I think sociologists, it's not that they aren't aware of the bi-directionality, but they probably would pay lip service to it. It's just that they often neglect to either theorize or to even empirically consider those types of research questions. Okay, thanks. I'm not a sociologist, so I appreciate that. I was just surprised to hear that. Thank you. Thank you, Seth. David, I, I believe you had a comment to both authors or a question. David Sloan Wilson, if you wanted to go ahead. Yeah, well, first of all, it's such an exciting event. I wanted to um, uh, actually continue uh, Russ's comment that um, although there's a, you know great high tech uh, improvements to the online environment. That's awesome to think about. Uh, I think that there is a sense in which uh, there are certain ingredients to high quality social interactions, regardless of whether they're online and offline. And if um, and if online social environments are deficient, uh, they can be improved in some of these ways, some of these low tech ways. And I think these are just, you know, how much do you identify with the group? Is the group doing meaningful? work, how safe do you feel, how much do you feel like a member, you know, um, if you're familiar with Eleanor Ostrom's core design um, uh, principles, they're needed for all groups. And then also a spiritual dimension um, as to which again comes back to the actual meaning of the of the group to you. So in my experience, uh, there are some online groups that I work with. Uh, they're extraordinarily Good. People come to them week after week. It fills their cup. It doesn't drain it. So I do think that there's scope. Um, even, of course, though, granting everything that you said about these deficiencies, which are super interesting, and you know, such things as eye contact and and you know, sharing with yourself while talking to others in the absence of touch are great stuff. 
but I wouldn't want to ignore the low tech part is what I wanted to say. Oh, I, I, I totally agree um, with all of that. And that it was going to be, somebody had asked about, you know, low tech solutions, sh short term solutions. And there are some that would actually go towards what you're talking about. I mean, the first thing you can do is right click on your picture and select hide self view. Turn you off. <laughs> um, I'm not doing that now, but I generally do do that because I think it makes a difference. I find myself thinking much less about how I might appear to others when my image is suppressed. Um, there's also, you know, video conferencing platforms like Jitsi. I've heard a lot of good things about, which boasts uh, very low latency video conferencing compared to other platforms, um, reducing distractions in the environment that you're in. But also I really like the point that you made about creating that sense of being a part of something, the group identity, the sense of being a part of a team. And so one of my recommendations for people in these teaching environments is to, if they can, you know, keep groups small or you know, have have students pair off into small groups and give them things to work on together in those small groups so they're, that the, they're not spending the entire time staring at a screen um, with multiple people and just getting distracted by that. So to the extent that you can break them off and have them do these group tasks that help build that sense of group identity and a sense of being a part of a team, I think would be really important. And that's a low tech solution as well. So I think there's all sorts of things we could do as we work towards improving the technologies that are available to us. Thank you. Um, thank you, Will. Um, we are technically out of time right now. Um, I could get one last question. And if any of you need to leave, you could um, also exit now. We're recording the session and we will send the link to everyone. Um, unanswered questions, we are also uh, collecting them and we will be try, trying to get answers for them as well. Um, I see somebody's hand on the screen, Ellen Hayes, I believe. I don't know, uh, is that because of you wanted to ask a question, Ellen? Yes, I, I'd like to just uh, comment on my experience last uh, week. Uh, when we had the Davos meeting, the Davos meeting going on for five days, I think, uh, this is an enormous meeting in a lot of preparation. And I've been struck by the fact that this is the first time, of course, that we've been able to see people relating to one another. You have a group of people, possibly five people, very influential, sometimes extremely wealthy, who are openly discussing issues and occasionally disagreeing. I'm reminded of the difference between what we get between the House of Commons in my country and the permanent, com the standing committees, who are groups from the different parties, but are committed to making sure that we make a decent job of a particular area. And I wonder whether this sort of ability to see people actually being made to think about an issue, to disagree and to possibly agree may have an influence on how we develop our politics. Just one remaining uh, observation, the fact that the human child is born with only part of its brain structured. And it's not only the influence of seeing others, but it's the influence of your brain developing to make sure of the use that you can make of things. I'll stop now, but we're heading for a very interesting situation with humanity, I think. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you so much. Well, thank you all for um, coming to our discussion. I'm going to end it here now. Um, thank you all, and thank you, Seth and Will, and um, Richard and Josh, as well. Um, it was a very interesting discussion. I appreciated everybody's uh, contributions and questions, and we will make the questions available, too. Thank you. <laughs>